Well, good morning. Good morning to you all. And welcome to Adult Faith Formation on this morning's topic, Defending the Faith, the Basics of Catholic Apologetics. I'd like to open this morning with a prayer. This is the student's prayer by St. Thomas Aquinas. I'm going to place it on our slide and feel free to read along all together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, divine creator, true source of light, fountain of wisdom, pour forth your brilliance upon my dense intellect, dissipate the darkness which covers me, that of sin and of ignorance, grant me a penetrating mind to understand, a retentive memory, method and ease in learning, the lucidity to comprehend, and abundance of grace in expressing myself. Guide the beginning of my work, direct its progress, and bring it to successful completion. This I ask through Jesus Christ, true God and true man, living and reigning with you and the Father forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome. My name is Father Dwayne Trombetta. Most of you know me by now. I've been effective almost a month in my new assignment as parochial vicar here at the Cathedral of St. John Berkman's, and I love my priesthood, and I love my assignment. I'd like to express my thanks to our rector, Father Peter Mangum, to Dr. Cheryl White, and to all the adult faith formation team for this invitation. Today's title is Defending the Faith, as I've said, an overview of apologetics. And I think it's good to start with some definitions. But first I want to go back to the prayer that we prayed and just make a comment. This is the prayer that I prayed every day at the beginning of my sacramental theology class at Notre Dame Seminary. And we prayed this every morning. And as you can see, there is a heavy emphasis on intellect, but it's grounded and rooted in Christ faith, and reason. And uh, this is such a beautiful prayer by St. Thomas Aquinas, the great angelic doctor of the church. We pray this every day, as I mentioned, and I'll say that at the end of the class, we had been praying it every day for the whole semester, and the professor said, okay, for today you get extra credit if you can write the prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas. By now, surely you have it memorized. But look at this prayer. It's not easy to remember, so I got a zero on that. <laughs> well, I just want to speak in general terms about adult faith formation, that it's a program that really in, attends to our hearts, our minds, our soul, and our body. And I think St. Thomas Aquinas would have loved the multi-dimension nature of this. This format gives us an integrated understanding as who we are in the eyes of our Creator, our Lord God. We are beloved children of God. This has been so far a world-class series. We've had excellent speakers and timely topics with an emphasis on history. And what I like best is that you continue to watch it again on our parish website. Well, I'd like to speak about myself just briefly. Um, as you may have known, I grew up right here in Shreveport. So I went to Catholic grade school at Christ the King School in Bossier Parish. I went to the Magnet School, which was new then. And I went all the way through LSU, Shreveport, and I got an undergrad degree in finance. I entered into a career in the surety industry, and I lived and worked in places like New Orleans and Houston and Hartford, Chicago, Dallas, and Denver. And it was only then, after many years, almost 20, that I entered the seminary at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago and then Notre Dame Seminary in New Orleans. And by the grace of God, June 5th, I was ordained a priest of Jesus Christ. And I think it's my hope anyway to bring the unique perspectives of having been a layperson for so long into my priestly ministry. Okay, as I mentioned, it's always nice to start with a definition. So really, what is apologetics? Well, the word comes from the Greek, apologia, and it was originally used to describe a defense or an answer given and reply to something. It's like a legal case presented before a judge and jury, 
And by definition, it's the art of explaining one's faith in such a way as to make a reasoned defense against detractors. So it's kind of a science that defends us, helps us how to know how to defend what we really believe in, how to articulate when somebody believes something different. And it's systematic, it's a, a method of discourse. I think it's important for us to know that apologetics is really twofold in its nature. First, it proves the divine origin of Christianity in general, that it is Christ, the Son of God, who establishes our faith. This is what we call the Christian evangelical demonstration. But then, then there's a second part, too, and that is it proves that Christianity finds itself entirely rooted in the Roman Catholic Church. And this is what's known as the Catholic demonstration or the dissertation on the true church, some scholars call this. We want to make sure, I was talking to Father James McClellan about this dimension yesterday, and we both agree that it's important to stress that every one of our friends who are Protestants, Baptists, and other denom Christian denominations <coughs> we believe in fundamentally the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we should treasure that when we're entering into discussions with them. Because God speaks truth through all denominations, and in fact, even in some non-Christian denominations, God is giving truths. Maybe it's moral truths, like you should just love others. And maybe it's doctrinal truths, like Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I wanted to put that into the definition to make clear this is what we're talking about in today's discussion. An apologist, of course, is one who speaks or write, writes in defense of something, in this case, Christianity. An apologist is a defender of Christian doctrine against pagans and schismatics and others, detractors. <clears throat> it's important also, <clears throat> excuse me, to note that this presentation um, is not to give every apologetic to de defense of every person's argument against Catholicism. We'd be here for an entire semester. But what I'd like to do is overview the topic, talk about its history, how it traces back to the origins of Christianity itself, and also talk about how really every assault on our faith has forced us to step up and defend our faith. And when we do that, that's a good thing. A good comes from something not so good. The church has often profited, in other words, by the works of defense made against heretics. So now let's clarify a couple more definitions. What is a heretic? A heretic is a proponent of a position that's at odds with established beliefs or teachings of the church. Quite simple. Somebody might say, yeah, I believe that God, Jesus was true God, but he wasn't really a man. He was really just a divine manifestation. Well, the church addressed that. And many more things in the early church. A schismatic is a person who creates or incites a rupture within the church based on their false beliefs. And that they continue in their error belief to such a degree that they may actually cause a splinter group. One example that we're dealing with today even is the East-West Schism, also known as the Great Schism of the year 1054, and that was when communion was broken between what's now the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Churches. I'd like to mention three works of the early church to give you an idea about how far back this endeavor, apologetics, goes. The first is Adversus Heresies, or in English, Ad Against Heresies. This was a five-volume work. Can you imagine five volumes? Just clarifying the nature of our faith by original church father, St. Irenaeus. Bishop of Lyon in France in the year 180 A.D., only 180 years after Christ. He wrote specifically against a, a heresy called Gnosticism. Another great work is called Para, Para, Panarion, and that's, also, that's translated as Medicine Chest. It was written by St. Epiphanius, 
of Salam Salamis in the 4th century AD. And again, this was a work that opposed heresies. I can't even say the person's name. Can you imagine trying to work out all the details of what he wrote? Brilliant work, though. And the other one that you might see referenced many, many times, and that is called Apologia. In English, that means the first apology, and that's an early Christian text defending the morality and the moral nature of Christian life, written by our dear Saint Justin Martyr in the second century. So just a word about sharing the faith. We're all called into this endeavor. We're called to tell others about our faith. And this is, traces all the way back to the Great Commission. Go therefore, Jesus says to his apostles, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Matthew chapter 28. This is the root of so much of our theology, even our theology of baptism. So this is the Great Commission, and I'd like to discuss how it interrelates with what the Catechism of the Catholic Church calls the universal call to holiness, that call that we all share, even non-Christians. And that is, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew chapter 5. The Catholic Church, as I mentioned, the Catechism calls this the universal call to holiness, and it interrelates with what we just talked about, the Great Commission. Because if Jesus Christ sent his apostles and those after them to go out and make disciples, and we know that we're all called to be holy, doesn't it make sense that this endeavor should be a priority for Christians? So I guess one question you might be asking is, why did Jesus give the Great Commission? Well, the goal of the church, as even written on our human hearts, is to come in relationship with God. Now, some of you may have been at church about a week ago when I preached about the old Baltimore Catechism. Remember I told you that I made my students memorize that three-part definition of the sacraments, an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. And I made them repeat it over and over. An outward sign instituted by Christ. They were so angry with me. But I knew it was important, and by the end of the semester, they were loving it. My sixth graders at St. Catherine of Siena Parish in Metairie. I bring that up because the Baltimore Catechism, it was all about memorized truths. And it's committing those into heart. It's not just some rote definition. It's something that gives life. Question number six of that great Baltimore Catechism asks, why did God make man? And the answer is, everybody say together, God made man to love, know him, to love him, and to serve him in this world, and to be happy with him forever in heaven. Love is all about sharing. Love is all about the reason that God made us. And so love, by its very nature, seeks communion with others. We're all called to be imitators of God through the world, through our faith, by our actions. And by Christian example, we should call others into that love. The internal is brought to the external. Faith into action. This is what the universal call to holiness is about. This is why Jesus gave us the Great Commission. So, I don't know if you've ever had these discussions with your friend who says, Catholics, what are you guys doing over there, worshiping statues? It's kind of hard to say, well, no, we, we, we don't. I, we, uh, well, why do you have them in your church? Well, you know, at times it's hard to articulate clearly, even for the most faithful Catholics, articulate our faith, what we believe, into words that make sense to somebody who's just not familiar with our faith practices. So some common objections or fears is I just don't know where to start. That's why I don't engage in apologetics or that's why I don't talk about religion at work. I'm not knowledgeable enough. What if I get out-argued? What if I fail? I'm not outgoing enough or I'm just embarrassed. These are great objections and we need to overcome them. So I wanna say 
the answer to your next question is how do I overcome them? And the answer is in this slide, St. Luke tells us, do not worry about how you are to defend yourselves or what you are to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour what to say. Isn't that beautiful? This is a prayer that a priest prays when he's preparing his homily. Holy Spirit, I know I'm just a person, but your work needs to be done. So fill me so that I can, say, I can know what I am to say. So there's no real need for eloquence. Sometimes we're sloppy with our words, but we make really good points. And that leads us to the second quote, which I wanted to tell you all. And that's when I, this is from St. Paul saying this, the great author of much of the whole New Testament. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, it, I did not claim, come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. This is St. Paul himself relying on the Holy Spirit to give him words. Well, part of overcoming is also related to the gifts that we have received. Part of overcoming objections is that we all can deploy the many spiritual gifts that we're given. St. Paul says in Romans, we have gifts that differ according to the graces given to us, and these include prophecy, ministry, teaching, exhortation, generosity, leadership, compassion, pretty varied list of gifts. Some have administration, some are terrible administration, some have good time management, some are terrible, and you follow the, the rest of the story. I guess what I want to say is that we have this Bible memory verse that comes from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit, and to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So if you really don't have a gift for this gift or that, take assurance because you have gifts and other things. But we all have at least the ability to engage conversantly in pretty much everything that the church gives to us. Again, we have many gifts, but we are all one body and we all believe in the same core truths of our faith. Well, I'd like to give... Um, something of a, a teaching about the framing of good questions and answers. So there's a great apologist from a website that I'll be talking about later called formed.org, Trent Horn. He says, we don't need to have all the right answers, just the right questions. We need to be skilled at navigating discussions when we're stumped. We need to be able to find and build on common ground and we need to keep ourselves civil Otherwise, we'll slip down that slippery slope and turn apologetics, a good thing, into an argument, a bad thing. So with that in mind, I'd like to say a personal example. Now, when I was a seminarian, I re received an accusatory question because of my desire to become a priest. A person came up to me and said, don't you want to get married? And the way, the tone of the voice the nature of the question it was hard to answer that. Of course I want to get married. I, I was thinking that's all I've ever wanted. And yet the way the question was posed was really a challenging thing. Like the priesthood is bad because you give up marriage. And it, it was confusing to me. And I fear now, years later, looking back on that, that I may have missed an opportunity. First of all, to make a pretty good joke, I could have said, Get married? Well, thank you for the, uh, for the proposal, but I'm already, I'm already taken. <laughs> but really, I think what, I, what, I would have, what I've been best at is if I'd have said something like, God gave us the institution of the sacrament of marriage. It was instituted by Christ himself, and it's a good thing, a great thing. St. Augustine talked about marriage and how it produces the gifts of children and fidelity and sacrament, the three goods of marriage. Of course, marriage is a good thing. And so for me to choose to forego this good thing must mean that there's a good thing that may be for me even better. And it's not a choice between a bad and a good. Should I do this destructive behavior or should I not? It's a choice between two goods. 
Now we've got the question framed up better. Now we've got a, a, the way that we can discuss that from that point forward is, is ready to be dialogued. It's about reframing the question. I hope that's a good example, but that's one that stands out in my memory that I thought might be helpful for you all. Some other examples of questions you might have heard. We are here in Shreveport, Louisiana, the Bible Belt, and many of our friends are um, not Catholic, but Christians. We get questions like, why do Catholics pray to statues? Why do Catholics worship Mary? Purgatory, what is the church's teaching on purgatory? This is a big one. Cultural issues like same-sex unions and immigration. Moral issues, abortion, contraception, end of life, <coughs> utilitarianism. Social justice issues like voting. Things like, uh, why do Christians choose blind faith and religion over verifiable scientific study? Well, you and I know that some of the greatest scientific inventions known to humankind have been made by Roman Catholic priests. The solar system, the microscope, so many of our great advances in gene, uh, the study of genealogy and genetics. And I guess the greatest question of all that we might encounter in the endeavor of apologetics is, why should I believe in anything? A person who asks you that question is in kind of a state of despair. And we need to approach questions like that with love and compassion. Because those people need us not just as a teacher, but as a friend. We need to be there for each other, celebrating the unity that we share as children of God. And that's our next line, unity. You ever hear that term, the transcendentals? These are... These are characteristics of God that are so closely tied to what he is that they're only notionally different from the existence of God himself. And these are one true good. Unity, truth, goodness. So, we are made in the image and likeness of God and these three characteristics are so tied to God and if we're made in his image and likeness, then guess what? The transitive property tells us these three characteristics exist in us too. We are one, the body of Christ. We are true, we seek truth, we order to it. It's written in our human hearts and we're good. We know what good uh, to do for our children and we know what good to do for others. The definition of good is, the philosophical definition anyway is, can anybody like to take a guess at what a good definition of good is or goodness? It's, uh, yes? Positive, positive uh, behavior towards another. Great. Positive behavior towards another. What she described is an outward manifestation of human act when filled with the good. The good is really about that which all things stri strive. That to which all things strive. So we're tied up with God. God's tied up with these three transcendental characteristics. Among them is unity. We all desire unity, and when we're unified as a body of Christ, there is an integrity about that, right? When you've got a car with probably thousands of parts in it, and when they're all put together right, you've got a good car that runs well. But when it's missing a few parts, it's lacking in integrity. Another good definition for us right now would be the word integration. When we are whole, we are integrated. And when we're broken apart, we are disintegrated, but when else do we hear that word disintegrated? The Star Wars movies, when the spaceships blow up, it looks really messy. So disintegration is really something we need to um, avoid, especially in dealing, relating all this to the endeavor of trans, uh, and the endeavor of apologetics. Faith helps us explain the human experience, relationships, desires of the heart, and we all share those things. That's why apologetics is sometimes a little easier than we might think. Now, Dr. Cheryl White has talked many times about this phrase, faith seeking understanding. It's a familiar Catholic phrase, phrase because what it means is that we are all grounded in the solid philosophy, solid theology, and all that 
helps us to understand better what God is, but we really don't need it. Sometimes we can just tell. We can just tell when we love someone else. We can just tell when we look at an infant how we just want to care for that and nurture that child. The desire for caring for others, the desire for truth, other core desires, these are why people tend toward religion in the first place. You've also probably heard that familiar expression, we all long for something greater than ourselves. I did a search on a search engine for that, and I came up with the top 25, and most of them were from sports, from actors. People are using that phrase not in relation to religion. They might not even be religious people, and yet they know that truth. We all long for something greater than ourselves. Now, when we as Christians say phrases like that, we're talking about our faith in God, our creator. So, I'd like to talk about this great quest now, and that is God versus not God. This is the big question for a non-believer. So when we engage in apologetics, sometimes we're talking about a person who's a believer, maybe just not a believer in our faith practices, and sometimes we're talking about someone who doesn't believe at all. Somebody who rejects faith in God. So, this is the endeavor. If you can come to a belief in God, then the next question is, well, then why should, I, I get it, I believe that there is some creator of all things. The next question is, should I be a Christian? In other words, should I believe in his son, Jesus Christ? I might be able to believe that some design creator created the universe, but how is it personal to me? And it's then that we introduce, well, God has a son who was like us in all things but sin, who had feelings and emotions and experienced pain, who had a family. And that's the immediate way that we relate to, relate to God through Jesus. So can we convince this person or open up their hearts to believe in the tenets of Christianity? And once that decision is made, if we're able to open up the person's heart and mind to belief in God and then in Christianity, then the next question is why Catholicism? Why this particular expression of Christianity? The trick is with apologetics is that we approach this endeavor from all these various starting points because not everybody that we're going to end up having conversations with is in the same starting point. Some might be at that pure point where they're believing in no supreme being at all. Some might be believing in God but not Christianity, and some might be Christians but not Catholics. How do we go about engaging with them? Well, the good example that I can recommend is to follow St. Paul. St. Paul, in the book of Acts, gave a sermon at a place called the Areopagus. And his sermon, as documented in Acts, is a classic example of biblical apologetics. He speaks to his listeners on their own ground, starting on their terms. Because guess what? They were not Christians and they were not Jews. These were probably Romans, pagans. So he, he makes his argument in a, what we would call these days a culturally appropriate way. He quotes secular writers, not Christian Catholic writers, not people who were followers of Jesus, and yet people who they respected. The Cretan poet Epimenides and also the Sicilian poet Eratus. And once he got their trust, he established that he was intelligent, he, he cared enough about them to learn the things that they knew, he established a relationship, and then their minds were open and prepared to receive the teachings about Christianity. In modern times, what do we call this? Meeting people where they are. We hear that expression so often. Well, apologetics is a regular feature of Paul's ministry. All Christians share now, as Christians, this task of apologetics, but apologetics alone is not adequate for presenting the gospel. As I've said, knowledge of the faith is powerful, but we also must know relationships. This is where we started, right, with this conversation. We started about meeting people where they are and sharing 
uh, this brotherhood that we're all made in the image and likeness of God. So the powerful weapon that we have are spiritual. The weapons of our battle are not of the flesh, books, teachings, but are enormously powerful, capable of destroying fortresses. We destroy arguments and every pretension raising itself against the knowledge of God. Again, St. Paul in 2 Corinthians. So I've been quoting a lot from St. Paul in his letters to the Corinthians, and one of the reasons I chose these particular scripture verses is because Paul was the founder of the church in Corinth. And if you had founded an organization or a club or a church community, you did that out of love, right? Paul loved them. And this is what he says um, to another church, Philippi, the Philippians. This is my prayer, that your love may increase ever more and more in knowledge and every kind of perception. St. Paul loved the people of Corinth. St. Paul loved the people of Philippi, the Philippians. And this is the way we have to approach apologetics, through love. Well, I mentioned before that Shreveport is in the Bible Belt, but I want to share something else about Shreveport that makes us, that puts us in a unique cultural way. I attended one summer for my uh, priestly uh, seminary and assignment, uh, an institute, an educational program of spirituality and studies called the Institute for Priestly Formation at Creighton University in Omaha. And there were 180 of us seminarians from dioceses all over the United States. And I made good friends with a seminarian from Seattle. And I said, boy, you know, it's really hard being in North Louisiana because so many people there are Christians but not Catholic. This is the Bible Belt. And he said, let me explain something to you that's even a little more strange. That is, many of the people of Seattle are not Catholic but they're not Christian at all. It's a very super secular environment there. And I thought, whoa, isn't that interesting to hear another person's perspective? Here we are, at least we're in a community that Christianity is, has taken hold. In fact, Louisiana evidences that because we are one of the most pro-life states. In a place like Seattle, where secularism has taken hold, they're fighting a double battle against non-believers inviting them, and I shouldn't call it a battle, but it's a circumstance in which we invite the non-believers into communion with us to be believers and then also to, to become believers and practitioners of our faith, Catholicism. So, back to Shreveport, we do have many Christians here, but many are skeptical of Catholics. And when we talk about apologetics, we are forced to deal with these skeptical suspicions. And obviously we can't argue with them relentlessly, but instead establish relationships with them. Jane Snyder here in the Cathedral Parish runs a ministry called the Cathedral Outreach. And part of that is this process of ecumenism. Ecumenism is a word that simply means the art and practice of trying to build unity among the world's Christians. Some of that is this Thursday night. We're going to have a dinner over at one of the Protestant churches in Shreveport where a bunch of people from a bunch of different faith practices come together and share in ministry, serving the people, the homeless, those in need, based on the common fact that we all believe in Jesus Christ and we all believe that we're doing his work. So this is something that... Um, that I'd like to say that once establishing these relationships that others will see that we're good in our hearts and open to the truth and it's only then that we can go about apologetics most effectively. Okay, so what happens when we don't do apologetics effectively? It can be toxic. If all we're trying to do is argue the other person wrong, that doesn't make any friends. Justin Martyr, in that document I mentioned earlier, the Apologia, wrote to show this emperor, Antonius, that Christians weren't trying to destroy the empire, but to seek truth, to be good citizens, to be faithful to God. And once the emperor realized that Christians weren't a threat, he began to be more friendly to them. So again, this is where I want to mention that word apologia, 
the root word for apologetics. It doesn't mean to apologize, but it means to give an account, to show reasons why one believes and behaves as they do. What old, what's old is, is what's new. I titled this slide, What's Old is What's New, because sometimes in the early church, some people were of goodwill. They were just confused about what Christ was, who he was, and how to understand him. And in the midst of that, the bishops, sometimes coming together in synods, conclaves, and meetings, they would offer clarifications. It's only then that people may have accepted or rejected those clarifications and become heretics or schismatics. But initially, they may have really thought, hey, I'm trying to do something good. What I believe is seeking the truth. It's just that they may have been wrong, and the church had to address that by making clarifications. Even St. Paul's letters, as I mentioned, to the Corinthians and the church in Thessalonica, much of his writings to them was to correct their behaviors that had become um, not pointed toward the truth of Christ. As a spiritual father, he was giving them reasons to act. This is what you all do to your children, to your family members, if you're a manager up at work, to your, to your employees, to help them know truth, to explain why, and to know that you're there for their good. This is why apologetics must always be about love. Okay. We started with a prayer by St. Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor, and I'd like to paraphrase a little about what he taught on this. He gave an analogy of a little old lady who had all more faith than all the great philosophers and theologians. She wasn't well educated, but she knew what she believed and she wouldn't change her mind for anything. She just felt it in her heart. Lots of us know people like that. These are people of great faith and they believe in their hearts despite the fact they didn't go to seminary or may not have had a degree in theology. They just know it because it's true. Others are not so easy to believe. They, need, they desire to know more about the unity and integrity that I talked about before. In other words, all people have different reasons behind what their struggle is and different reasons for seeking new belief. We don't know their obstacles, and so if somebody comes to us, I know this happens to me a lot, um, in the airport or at the grocery because I wear an outward sign, a clerical collar, People want to talk. Oh, so you're a priest. Let me tell you why I'm mad at the church. <laughs> but you know what? I wear my collar everywhere because I'm proud of it. And I'm willing to get some into some difficult arguments. And I'm willing to say, you know what? The church hurt you and I'm sorry. Wish that hadn't happened. But I want you to know that I want to be part of the solution. So let's talk. And what a great way that's been for me to engage with complete strangers and make some friends out of that. But it can happen to you all, too, if they know that you're Catholic. They see the church bulletin laying on your counter when they come over to visit. Oh, your church. It's a Catholic church. Tell me. And so you might not know where they are. You might not know whether they're one of those people who just believes it deep because they believe it's true. Or maybe they're one of those people who really needs to know about unity and integrity and theological doctrines. So don't let that be an obstacle. Be inviting. Ask them. Tell me about you and your faith. And I think that gives the gospel the best opportunity to reach into their, into their hearts. Okay. Apologetics gets a bad rap. This is something that I know that you know already. Probably when you heard the topic, either you didn't know what apologetics was, or maybe you weren't really sure about what it was, or maybe you said, I know what it is, I just don't want to do it. <laughs> so in the moment of trying to prove, <clears throat> one of the reasons that apologetics gets this bad rap is that when we're trying to prove that we're right, if we see the world in terms of black and white arguments, that becomes also trying to prove another person's wrong. And that's not what this is about, right? We want to prove ourselves right, 
but not because you're wrong, because you're also right. That should be our goal. That's like the analogy of a candle. So if you have a candle, it's burning brightly, it's got plenty of wax, and somebody else has a candle and theirs isn't lit. So you say, let me share some of this light with you. You light your candle onto theirs, and theirs is burning brightly now. But look at yours. You didn't lose anything. Yours is still burning just as bright. It's still just as beautiful. But now theirs is bright too. Another example that I find helpful, just, I just want to share with you some examples that I have found helpful. And one is a beautiful gemstone. You have in your hands your Catholic faith. It's a shiny, polished diamond. And you've polished it by going to Mass, receiving the sacraments, attending adult faith formation, and polishing it up. And somebody else has in their hand what looks like a bunch of dirt. And you look at theirs and say, you don't say, look at your dirt pile. You look at yours and say, let me help you clean that up a little. And so you help them to dust it off, polish it, rub it, shine it a little bit. And next thing you know, they've got a shiny diamond too. And you still have your shiny diamond. You use theirs, yours, to help them to have one just as beautiful. These are two analogies that I find helpful about it understanding what it means to share faith. So, um, I guess what I'm saying is beware that when we're engaging in dialogue that it becomes, uh, that it transfers from um, a true dialogue into just a simple monologue where you're preaching at somebody. Okay, or like a lecture. That can, of course, be an obstacle um, to a person's receipt of the truth. They might be pulling their candle away and you never get close enough to even light it because you're scaring them off. So be inviting, and this gives the gospel the best opportunity to reach, uh, reach their heart as well. I have two slides on that because it's a pretty important topic. A bad rap, two of two. There is something called proof texting. Have any of you heard of this phrase? Christians do this a lot with each other. Because what it means is using or citing sacred scripture out of context to make a point. Many people point to this verse or that to, to get it to say what we want. Now, there is unity in sacred scripture. When you pick up a Bible, it's one codex, it's one book, and from the beginning of the end, it's the word of God, inspired by God and authorized by the church into an established canon of books which contain truth. But there are some variances in the books um, of the Bible. Some of it's related to historical context. The way Moses spoke to the ancient Israelites is certainly not the same way, for example, that St. Paul spoke to the Christians of the early church. Bishop Robert Barron, one of my great favorite contemporary theologians talks about the Bible in terms of being less like a book and more like a library. Have you heard that expression? So right, there's a history, go to a library, there's that history section, there's that legal section, there's a poetry section, a beautiful poetic things. There's an apocalyptic story and there's biographies and others. So the history section is things like Numbers and Deuteronomy. The law section of the Bible is things like the first five books, the Pentateuch, the, what the Jews call the Torah. In the poetry section is things like um, the Song of Psalms, and you know the rest. The Gospels are like a genre, that un, unique to themselves, kind of like a, a historical biography of Christ, but more exhortative in nature. And lastly, there is that section in every library called Mythology. Genesis and certain other books are mythological in nature. But when we say myth, we don't mean something that's just made up to tell a truth. It means mythological in that it may not be exact and precise word for word, but it does contain truth that's useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness, as St. Paul would say. I'm saying all this because we can't use the Bible of one genre and expect it to be just like a Bible section from another genre. Um, so there's genre, language, historical context, 
continuity of God's divine pedagogy or step-by-step -step teaching method. There is something that, um, and I'm going to get to it in a minute. Oh, it's on the next page. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and talk about we must not prove text. We must not take sections of the Bible out of context. And we must not be more interested in winning an argument. Because sometimes we do that, aggressive arguing, just to shield our own insecurities. And that's not what we're about as Christians. Again, another word, another slide about one of my favorite modern and contemporary scholars, Bishop Robert Barron. He was the um, rector or president of Mundelein Seminary uh, during the time I lived in Chicago. And by God's grace, I was able to meet him and even have lunch with him at the seminary once. He talks about the need for what he calls a new apologetics. So this is contemporary movement happening on the same subject matter that we're covering today. He says there's a deep misunderstanding of Catholic theology. And he gives an example, number one, about biblical fundamentalism. Okay, this continues from that last line. He says this is something that's espoused not by religious people per se, but by people who are ideological secularists. Um, I think probably one of the people he has in mind is that comedian Bill Maher, who has a TV show on HBO, because Bishop Barron has a YouTube video uh, addressing some of the things that Bill Maher has said on his TV show and in his book, which um, uh, makes effort to refute Christianity. Bishop Barron says that some of these uh, non-religious people dismiss sacred si scripture as nonsense or fairy tales or Bronze Age mythology, that's a Christopher Hitchens term, or pre-scientific nonsense. And he cites what Bill Maher himself said. He refutes the Bible by saying, how can you believe in the book of Genesis? It's got talking snakes. Jonah in the belly of the fish and about the universe being only 5,000 years old when we have clearly evidence that there are fossils, fossil records older than that. Well, the Catholic Church has responded even since before Bill Maher had his own TV show and that's the church gave us a document in the Second Vatican Council called Dei Verbum. And it's something that gives us teaching about how to address things, arguments like this. It tells us that the sacred scripture isn't a book. It's a library. And different parts and different sections of the library need to be read, read in different ways. Of course, we don't read the poetry section expecting it to give us historical truth. We read it expecting flowery language. And we don't read the mythology section like the book of Genesis that it necessarily needs to happen, that on the third day God created this, and on the fourth day God created that. Perhaps they use the word day in the Bible to mean an increment of many years. So the word day may not need to be treated literally. Does that mean we don't read the Bible and know that it's truth? Of course not. The Bible is truth. Sometimes it's just straightforward. Sometimes it's metaphorical, symbolic, poetic. That also, that sort of, sort of a point of view also demonstrates a certain ignorance of the ancient Catholic tradition of interpreting texts as, different, as affecting different senses. So, for example, St. Augustine said that the, any scriptural reading should be interpreted in a moral sense. What was the original author trying to tell us? How do we amend our behavior morally based on what we're reading? an allegorical sense, and also a mystical sense. So, non-literalistic readings of books such as Genesis have been offered since the time of the ancient church fathers, Origen and Augustine. So the church has already dealt with this. It's not new. And it can be frustrating because that point of view, that secularist, fundamentalist view, is very popular in our modern culture right now. It's widely held, it's been widely disseminated, and if you go to a college campus, more people will probably hold that point of view than the Christian Catholic point of view. And that's something that gives demonstration to that question we asked at the very beginning of this talk, and that is, why should we all do apologetics? 
Why did God, why did Jesus give us the Great Commission? Okay, another example from uh, Bishop Robert Barron is an appropriate understanding of God. Many people assume that God is just this mystical figure, such as Zeus or Poseidon. He gives other examples. Sometimes um, people who argue against Christianity say, oh, God is just this imaginary creature, and they give it a name so um, obscure that it's almost laughable, the flying spaghetti monster. And everybody laughs because, oh, isn't it silly that these people believe in God, a flying spaghetti monster. But they're lacking the insight that Catholic philosophy and theology speak of God in a very sophisticated metaphysical way the unmoved mover, first love, the uncreated creator, creator, one whose essence is its existence. And uh, you may have also heard God described in philosophical terms as that than which nothing greater can be conceived. It basically means God is supreme. He's not a creature who exists. He is existence itself. Modern materialists assert that science can explain all reality, but what's incomplete about that is that the physical sciences can describe the characteristics and dynamics of finite things, and they can answer all those how questions, like how does this molecule bind with this other molecule, but they can't understand the why questions, such as why did God create all things, and why is there something rather than nothing? These are questions that we as Catholics love to undertake in the endeavor of scientific study, rational study, tapping into our rational intellect to come to our faith. I'm going to quote Dr. Cheryl White again, faith seeking wisdom. Okay, so another reason for the new apologetics is uh, some characteristics anyway, is that it must be formulated and argued with, with passion and with zeal. It must be intellectually formed. What would it look like? It would be smart. One of the great things about Catholicism is our intellectual tradition. It would be Marian. Mary is our model of vocations. She's the one who pondered what it meant when the angel approached her and said, you will be given a son and you shall name him Jesus. It must incorporate all the church fathers, reflect church history, people who have committed and contributed so much to the writings that enlighten our minds even today, like Augustine, who I've quoted, like St. Aquinas, who wrote that prayer at the beginning, like St. Bonaventure, more modern, John Henry Newman, Chesterton, one of my favorites, uh, St. John of the Cross, and so many others. We must also acknowledge that there is a certain hostility to our faith in this culture. We don't like saying that. We don't like admitting it. But it's true and we can only be effective at least if we acknowledge that. And we must be willing to go public. That's why I love what our cathedral is doing right now. We have a whole so um, social media team who's using things like Facebook and Instagram, whatever that is, and the website. To, to use and to access a wide cultural audience. And even I'm trying. I set up a Twitter feed and I've got Instagram going and everything. And we must be joyful because as warriors for Catholicism, we are warriors, but happy, happy warriors. Okay, I just want to quote this quick little video because there's a video on YouTube that you should watch. It's two minutes and 20 seconds and it's Father Robert Barron, Bishop Barron, he was father at the time when this happened. And Dr. Scott Hahn discussing this topic, the new apologetics. And they're so eloquent in their speech that in that two minutes, they can cover a lot of ground. And I encourage you, if you have time, to watch it. It says they argue that it's important to join forces with people like fundamentalists, Pentecostals, Charismatics, Protestants, to receive the light of faith through the light of sacred scripture and tradition because we share what we talked about at the very beginning, and that is that which is written in our human hearts. Well, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. We'll leave a little room at the end for Q&A. 
But I would like to write uh, one last slide about why is all this important. We've talked a little about this before, but I want to bring it all into summary now. We have a responsibility as Christians to the best of our ability to know what we believe and to know it well. There's no reason to believe something unless it's true, right? We're all skeptics in that way. We don't need to be taught that. But God created us to be in his image and likeness, and that means to use those transcendental characteristics and stress the beauty of oneness, truth, and goodness. To use our reason and intellect, that which differentiates us from all other created things. We can't choose something unless we know it, and so we should know our faith. The proper object of the mind is truth. Oh, the mind. I guess I was Irish when I wrote that. <laughs> and uh, the proper object of the heart is love. So truth and love stand at the fundamentals of, of this endeavor called apologetics. To better be able to do apologetics, we must educate ourselves, enlighten our own minds. The sources of the information that I used to gather for this talk today have been sacred scripture. I've tried to incorporate some applicable quotes, the catechism of the Catholic Church, websites that, um, that are strong and, and, and orthodox in their truth, Catholic answers, documents of our faith, word, uh, documents like Dei Verbum, contemporary theologians who speak to us today because they're living our contemporary lives, people like Bishop Robert Barron and his great Word on Fire ministry, and one last um, uh, source is called formed.org. Now, formed is a very expensive subscription-based service, but we at the Cathedral Parish are able to offer it to all parishioners absolutely free. And it doesn't require anything other than just to access using the code that we give to you on our website. So go to sjbcathedral.org and there's a slide banner across the front and it's got current events and things. The fourth one is called Formed. You single click on it and follow the registration procedure and it gives access to thousands of studies, movies, children resource, children's resources, audio books and ebooks, digital media media from 40 of the best Catholic content producers, including the ones you already know, like the Augustinian Institute, Ignatius Press, the US CCB, EWTN, the St. Paul Center, Knights of Columbus, Focus, and many, many more. So it's an online platform that also has apps for your Android and iOS devices. And what I love about that is if you put the app on your phone and you're going on a trip, you can just dial up an ebook, put it up to your car by Bluetooth, and listen to an ebook for free while you're traveling. So it's a really great resource. It's an aid for individuals and communities like ours to know and love, to learn about and share our faith. And it's got components to study and watch and listen, read, even Spanish resources. So please, I do encourage you to go back today while it's fresh on your mind and Get signed up for formed.org.